जननम सुकदम मरणम करुणम मिलनम मधुरम स्मरणम करुणम कालवशादिह सकलम करुणम समयादिपते अकिलम करुणम Welcome to the Future of Cities by Finnish Flow. Finnish Flow is coordinating the Finnish business community participation at Davos side events, the World Economic Forum side events. Finland has a lot to offer in the global context, and this is what we are shining a light on as Finnish Flow community with our amazing partners. This is our first year, and this is our great big opening for the Finnish Flow. Thank you very much for all coming here. And now when we're entering the flow, I would love to introduce our dear partner, Future of Cities, Tony Cho. Thank you, Jana. Thank you, esteemed guests. Thank you, Deepak. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Sadhguru. What a phenomenal experience today of transformation, aligned thinkers, working on global transition to a more regenerative future. At the Future of Cities, we are aiming to impact the lives of a billion people through innovations in the built environment. And today I'm hopeful and so grateful to my partners from Finnish Flow and to be part of this beautiful Finnish community of innovators and impact investors and technologists and visionaries. It's a true honor and I can only imagine and dream together with you guys what the future will hold. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then we move into this very, very special wisdom panel. <clears throat> On this panel, our panelists will offer a mix of spiritual leadership and next generation indigenous wisdom. Helena Gualinga is an environmental and human rights activist from Ecuador. Her activism includes exposing the conflict between her community and oil companies by carrying an empowering message among the youth in local schools in Ecuador and also globally. She's a youth ambassador of the Arct Arctic Base Camp here in Davos and they have facilitated her attendance uh, to Davos. Deepak, Dr. Deepak Chopra is the founder of Chopra Foundation, a nonprofit entity for research on well-being and humanitarianism and global, also founder of Chopra Global, a modern day health company at the intersection of science and spirituality. Satguru is a yogi, mystic and visionary who has founded the global Isha Foundation, launching large ecological initiatives. Satguru is currently also on a solo tour, driving a motorcycle from London to India, advocating the conscious planet movement to save the planet's soil. And tonight, we will we'll have a wonderful moderator, Vera Futorianski, a CEO at Veritas Ventures, a woman in tech and VC and a global speaker. That being said, over to you, Vera. Thank you so much. It's my microphone. Thank you so much, Jana and Risto. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. I might be biased, of course, but I don't think there's a more interesting, more exciting, more mind-expanding panel in all of Davos 2022 than this one. So you definitely are in the right place. Welcome. <laughs> welcome also to everyone who's watching live. Is it this camera? So welcome, everyone. Um, let's dive right in. We'll only have 35 minutes, unfortunately, because Salguru will have to travel, so we'll go right in. We all know our planet is facing a lot of uh, global challenges. Um, this week we all and the leaders gather here, we're also leaders, to find solutions for a more sustainable future. 
And this discussion will cover three critical points. The soil crisis. As we all know, it's a big issue. You saw the economists cover today. We talk about food crisis. If we don't make any changes in the next 10 years, if I got it right, the next 200 years there will be a food crisis on the planet. Already 52% of agricultural soil is degraded. In 20 years, 40% less food is expected to be produced for the 9.3 billion people who will be living on our planet. Then we'll talk about the loss of biodiversity. Global loss of biodiversity is at its worst, as you know. And only 5% of indigenous people, I mean, they're only 5% of indigenous people, and they're the stewards of 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. And Helena is here with us, who will talk um, about it. And of course, um, not many of us touch soil on a daily basis, or not many of us live in, uh, in the jungle, in the, for in the forest. So we will also talk about um, anxiety and depression, and with that also about the shift, we need, this conscious shift, we need to understand the world better and how we can become more aware, conscious, meta-humans. And for that, we'll have Dr. Deepak Chopra um, inviting us into it. But we'll start with Sadhguru. It's such a pleasure to be sitting next to you. I mean, it's such an honor, really. <laughs> you are now on a motorcycle from London to India. You've been to many places, you have this extraordinary campaign, you're meeting so many people, you also created a catchy song around it, <laughs> but one day singing it, but could you please share why you do it, and maybe most importantly also share a couple of tangible projects that have manifested along the way already. Namaskaram, good evening to... Namaste. Good evening to everyone, is it okay? Good well, the last thirty years I've been talking about soil at various <coughs> levels and we have launched projects. What I see is when I talk about the nature of soil and where it is going, everybody says, Sadhguru, this is great, fantastic, and they go to sleep. <laughs> and uh, as I speak to various agricultural ministries all over the world, everybody seems to know the problem, everybody knows the general direction of the solution. But when I observed this, I saw, after all, they're just waiting for an idiot to bell the cat. So here I am. <laughs> we just started this journey at the age of sixty-five, riding thirty thousand kilometers is an insane project. But we have completed sixty-five days and I'm still here. And uh, I have done uh, four hundred and sixty-seven events in the sixty-five days <laughs> wow. and The social media metrics is uh, showing that about two point one billion people have address soil in the last sixty-five days since we started the movement. The idea of this movement is to move at least sixty percent of the adult population on the planet to be concerned about soil, to say something about soil. Because in a democracy, the only currency is numbers. If the numbers are there, every government will move. At the same time, we have to understand this, that not in a single nation has ever sixty percent of the population has stood up and express their concern for some long-term well-being of their nation or their children or anything like this. They're asking for trinkets, they want one percent uh, tax reduction and they're getting it. Nobody has ever asked. So this is what we are trying to do now. We want sixty percent of the population, adult population, to express concern for long-term well-beings. Why this is important is we elect governments for four to five-year terms. So you give them a four-year mandate, and naturally they are focusing to fulfill that in four years, whatever they can do. Nobody wants to invest in something which will bear fruit after fifteen, twenty years, because whenever political leaders make an attempt to address long-term well-being of their nation, they lose the election next time. Mm -hmm. This has been the history of political life on this planet. This changing this is very important, that large number of people, over sixty percent, when they say that they are concerned about it, now governments feel comfortable to invest long term. We have written to seven hundred and thirty political parties on the planet to include soil <coughs> as a part of their manifestos, soil ecology as a part of their manifestos, because all the manifestos are only about tax cuts, this rebate, that rebate, never really long term well-being. Why is soil such an important thing? This is the first time in the history of humanity we are addressing soil as soil extinction. The UN agencies are using the term soil extinction. Extinction means you always thought it's either a di dinosaur or a dodo, but we are talking about soil extinction. And in eighty-five percent of the nations that I have spoken to, still agriculture ministries are addressing soil as an inert substance. 
Mm. It is very important that first of all we recognize soil as the largest living system, not just on this planet, in the known universe. A handful of soil has over eight to of life for us. We are just a consequence of what is happening in the fifteen to eighteen inches of soil. If we have to put, bring this to context in some way, see before photosynthesis started nearly a billion years ago, the oxygen content in our atmosphere was just one percent. Today it is twenty-one percent. It is because of this we have evolved this way, it is because of this we are breathing and alive right now. But in the last thousand years, we have removed eighty-five percent of the photosynthesis on the planet. What is the plan, really? Everybody is busy talking about carbon dioxide. I know it is an issue, I am not saying it's not an issue, that is also a significant issue, but if we put fair measuring mechanisms, over forty percent of the global warming and climate change is happening because of ploughed lands. Fifty-four percent of the earth's land is ploughed, seriously ploughed. Another eighteen to twenty percent is partially done. So nearly seventy-one percent of the land is under agriculture. This largest piece of geography where men and women are every day tending to it, we can't fix that. But everybody is talking about fixing the ocean, rainforest. She comes from there, but most other people who are living in cities, they have never seen what's a rainforest. As far as the rainforest is concerned, if you just stay out of it, it'll be doing great. Mm. There is no need for anybody to have a project <laughs> for that. <laughs> Forest is something that's managed itself for millions of years. It can last for millions of more years. It doesn't need our help. It just needs some respite from us. But agricultural land is part of our nourishment process, it is part of our economic process and this is where the real problem is and that's not been addressed. This is why the Safe Soil Movement, as I said, sixty-five days uh, <laughs> we are on, another thirty-plus days are there. So we want to get this to four billion people so that every government on the planet responds to this. What is the way out? This will always be the thing I can leave the, you know, the simple policy we've done. One important thing we need to do with soil is, we need to separate soil from the rest of the issues that we are trying to handle. Right now, I've looked at the European uh, Common Agricultural Policy, it's too complex. By the time you implement this, there will be debates and debates for another ten to fifteen years' time before actual application comes, because this involves major industries, major uh, lobbies in the world, it's not going to work like that. But if you talk about enhancing soil organic content, there is nobody on the planet who is against it. Not fertilizer industries, not pesticide industries, nobody is against it. Everybody is for it, because rich soil is the fundamental of rich life and good life for us. A healthy soil and healthy life are inextricably connected, there is no way about it. This is very simple, this does not need any great amount of technology, this doesn't need any great amount of financial outlays, it just needs that right now we are facing a wall. If we face the door and we are committed to going through the door, in the next ten to fifteen years we can make a significant turnaround. We have prepared one hundred and ninety-three soil policy handbooks for hundred and ninety-three different nations, considering their latitudinal position, their soil types, their economic conditions and their agricultural traditions. Because even if you have all the signs, you cannot turn the agricultural traditions around overnight. It takes certain amount of time. You have to work with this. These things have been presented to the nations. I addressed uh, COP15 just uh, last week in uh, Cote d'Ivoire and uh, the response has been great. Seventy-four nations have signed up for Save Soil policy right now mm -hmm. and it is a way forward. We need all of you to enhance the message. Do not think this is my project, this is not my project, you don't have to talk about me. Talk about soil, make sure everybody talks about soil because this is where our future is. There are many other issues in the world, I'm not saying they are not important, they are important, but first we have to be alive to handle other issues. If soil starts degenerating, right now twenty-seven thousand species per year are going extinct organisms. It is a slide. It is expected in twenty-five to forty years we will get to a place 
where even if we want to regenerate the soil, we will not be able to do it because that will be the level of biodiversity loss. In my gut feeling, I don't have any science for this, in my gut feeling, this slide will not remain a slide. At some point, it will be a tumble. Before it goes into a tumble, we have to push the slide backwards, otherwise we will be a very regretful generation. Thank you so much. And without, without soil, we won't have nutritious food. I think even now, 90% of food has lost its nutrition. And I would like, um, before all those 150 leaders leave this room, I'd like for them to have almost like a call to action. What can everyone do on an individual basis? Because many of us think our individual actions don't matter and something big has to be done. But as, as little as for the climate change, not leaving your flower on the floor in the hotel and not having needed, uh, you know, a clean flower, uh, tower, towel every day. So maybe about the soil, we can also speak. What can an individual do on a, on an individual basis? What can we do, each one of us, to save soil? See, uh, the moment, hello, the moment you say that everybody want to roll up their uh, sleeves and go and fix their kitchen garden, that's very cute, but that is not a solution. We've passed that stage. We've passed that stage where I do something wonderful, you do something wonderful and there'll be a solution. We have well passed that stage. We should have done this in seventies. Mm. You can't be talking about this in twenty, twenty-two, let's do something little and be happy. If you're doing this for your personal satisfaction, that's different. If you're doing it for a solution, right now, unless this is enshrined in the policy of the world, there will be no solution because you're addressing seventy-one percent of la Earth's geography. This is not going to be fixed by me doing something cute in my house and you doing wonderful things. Even if you have ten thousand acres of land, if you fix it, it's still not a solution because there is no guarantee the next generation will do the same thing for you unless it is made a law. When I say a law, see in urban lands there are laws. If you have ten thousand square feet of land, you cannot build a ten thousand square feet of building they will allow you to build six, seven, eight thousand square feet. But if you have ten thousand square feet, ten thousand acres of land, you can plow every inch of it, turn it into a desert in ten, fifteen years' time, nobody will ask you, why have you done it? Should this change or not? Thank you. Hello, Nam. Thank you so much for flying all the way from Ecuador. It's really a pleasure to have you here with the beautiful earrings. <laughs> I was just checking if she, she used those feathers to fly here. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful though. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, we don't bring enough, I mean, we're here in Davos and it's historically has been pretty much people of um, one color making decisions. We don't bring enough indigenous people to the table. I think it's so important to have people at the table whose lives we decide upon, right? They're not at the table enough, so it's a really big pleasure to have you here. Um, I think it's really important also for the audience to know for, that... For the little girl, come on. Yeah. <laughs> she, she, Helena she did is, use fossil fuels to fly. Well, but we need to hear her no, voice. I'm just so, yeah. <laughs> She's representing indigenous women. I'd like for you to speak about indigenous women in a second, about the role you play. I think important for everyone to know, and um, Helena will speak more about it, that... Um, only what a, one of few groups were able to protect the forest. The indigenous people are one of the few groups that can protect it. And Helena's tribe, if that's correct, took the Ecuadorian government to court in 2011 and won that battle. I mean, that that sink in, to, want, to win the battle. <laughs> to international it's, court. it's a first of its kind. Could you please tell us a little bit more about it and especially what role the indigenous women play in it? Yeah, of course. Um, Hi everyone, thank you for being here. Um, it's a pleasure to share this panel with you. Um, I come from a community called Sarayaku in the Ecuadorian rainforest. I grew up there and I also partly grew up in, in Finland. Um, but when I was, the year I was born, which is in 2002, an oil company entered my community without my people's consent. And there was this immediate response to this, which was, no, we don't want you here. Uh, we had already seen the devastating impacts that uh, the oil industry would have in the Amazon rainforest, what it would do to our health, what it would do to our water. We have 
uh, really horrible examples of what um, the oil industry's uh, activities uh, lead to in the Amazon. Um, so we had this very clear idea of, of we don't want the oil industry here. Um, and this is 20 years ago when no one knew what the Amazon rainforest was, basically. Um, there was no media covering this. There were no um, international NGOs, governments, nothing working um, in the Amazon or to protect the Amazon. Um, so we were a community of a thousand people uh, facing two of the biggest powers of my country, which is the government and the oil company. Um, my people knocked on every door they could find, which was taking them to um, a, a small court in, in the region. When that didn't work, they, did, they didn't accept the case. They took it to, uh, to the national court. They did not accept the case. And 10 years later, uh, in 2012, um, we were able to take the Ecuadorian state to international court for violating our human rights and for not respecting our rights to our territory. Um, this was the first one of its kind in not just the Amazon, not just in Ecuador, but in Latin America. So this changed the entire future of indigenous people's rights and our right to our territory across Latin America, not just in my country. Um, so and the indigenous women. Yeah. <laughs> And of course, I mean, that is um, those 10 years. I was a really, really young when all of this was happening. Uh, I, I come from a family uh, who has been very involved in this process. Uh, my aunt, my mother, my uncles, they've all been leaders in my community. Um, so I was always kind of running around. Uh, my mom was a leader at the time. I was someone who would never leave my mom's side, so I was attending all her meetings from the age of four uh, until now, whenever I can. Um, and, you know, uh, yeah, we had a really strong uh, leadership from, from the women in the community. And the women were actually the first ones to say no when uh, the proposal of the oil companies uh, uh, came they were the first one to say, no, we don't want this for our children. We don't want our children bathing in oil. That's what they said. Um, so it's really important to understand this relationship with, that women have, not only to, to land, but the entire rainforest, the entire ecosystem. And as you were saying before, we indigenous people, we are, only make up 5% of the world's population, but we... Um, we have 80% of the world's biodiversity in our territories. But inside of this, um, this statistic, these numbers, those territories are taken care of mostly by women. Um, so it's really, really important when we're talking about these things um, in, in, it, you know, in, in these spaces that we actually have a, a gender lens because you know, b uh, climate change impacts women more in so many ways. Um, and, and the violence that comes from the oil companies and the state is always going to affect women more. But women are also the ones that are the custodians of these lands. Um, and my sister always says this. She says, we have an experience as indigenous people when we're facing extractivism, when we're facing racism. But indigenous women have one specific experience of all of this. Um, and that is something that is you know, really important to, um, to, mm -hmm. to, to be aware of. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. We're protecting our Mother <laughs> Earth. Thank you. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and going back to uh, the, the, this landmark, you know, victory that we had uh, 10 years ago now, uh, we've been able to see many, many more victories in the Amazon in the, in, in, to protect the Amazon rainforest because he created this really important legal precedent. Um, and now, just uh, a, a year ago, two years ago, we had a really important victory in the, in, in the Ecuador and Amazon where thousands of hect hectares of land um, were protected. And this is because this really, really small community, which I come from, took the, the, the state to court and won. Um, so yeah, it's really important.
Thank you so much. Um, I'm just being told that the Guru has to leave in five minutes already. Dr. Chopra, do you mind if we let that Guru speak for five minutes, a few minutes and then... Absolutely. I, I don't have to say anything. Where, no, we have so many questions. <laughs> you have to. The whole meta human. Everybody wants to know about yeah. it. But yes, then... Uh, because this is about cities, I thought I shouldn't go without saying anything about it. This happened to me, <coughs> I was to speak in the San Francisco Union Club, San Francisco Club for a group of business people. I was driving about an hour, we were driving an electric car, but I saw both sides of the road were packed with cars. So this person who is a large-scale business there, I asked, what is the problem? that people who work, live here, work there, those who live there, work here, what is this problem we have? You live in one place, work in the opposite direction, those who live there, work in the opposite direction, why can't we at least rejig this a little bit? So as a part of that, I came up with the concept of one, one building city, that uh, today these proposals are still floating around with the South Indian governments, it should uh, become a reality in the next few years. That is outside the city, go, go thirty, forty, fifty kilometers away from the city, fifty acre land, only one acre you build, you can build fifty to hundred floors if you want. These remaining forty-nine acres will be completely eco-friendly, enough, enough forest, enough agriculture if you wish to do. You can grow enough fruits and vegetables that you need for this community, up to ten thousand people can live in the city. We cap the city as ten thousand is a limit for a city, don't have to be ten million. It's such a mess, these ten million cities, ten thousand. The major cities that we have could be slowly converted into really cultural attractions where people can come once in a week, in the weekend or whatever, whole week you don't have to start your car, completely no wastage going out. We have designed cities like this. I feel this should be the future because if you do not urbanize rural areas, the urban centers are becoming more and more chaotic and senseless and the amount of power and the amount of requirement that is there, the ecological footprint of an urban center is too heavy. This will not happen unless investment shift. Right now the number somebody was telling me here that seventy-two percent of the world's investment is in thirty-one cities on the planet. With this, how do you expect people to be forming in another thirty years? We did a survey in India out of sixty-three percent of Indian population which is in farming right now, not even two percent of the farmers want their children to become farmers. This is where food security problem is. Unless we create urbanized villages, unless we make it attractive for people to live on the land, most people as they get qualified, they will all pile up into the cities. I think this is something we must avoid. Those of you who are looking at the future cities must definitely address this issue. I'm extremely sorry, I'm never known to uh, do this, leaving halfway through the meeting. This is not me, but uh, I have a… tomorrow, eleven o'clock, I have a big event in Muscat. I need to be there and uh, I have to fly now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I'll just move closer to you and we'll continue.